The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar. I am joined today by Animet Haas and she is Principal Consultant from NNIT Denmark and she will be presenting the core of testing, dynamic testing process according to ISO 29119. And if you have any questions for any Met about any of the content of this webinar, and if you want to discuss it a little further, you can do so over on Test Huddle. There is a discussion created, and I am just going to send you all the link now. So you should see in your chat box there is a link there that will bring you right into the discussion. So I'm now going to hand you over to today's presenter, Annie Met. Hello, Annie Met. Hello, Derek. How are you? Great, great. And you? Fine, thank you. So welcome everybody. My name is Animator Hess and you can see what I looked like some years ago here in the left corner. I work at uh, NNIT, uh, Consultancy in IT Development, Implementation and Operations here in Denmark. We have about 2,000 employees in all, uh, about half in Denmark and we also have offices in the US, in Switzerland, on the Philippines and in China. Um, I've been looking very much forward to, uh, to doing this webinar for you today. I think maybe some of it will be a bit controversial. Um, just having ISO 29119 in the title is perhaps controversial in itself. Um, I've been on the working group for about, what, six years? Now, so I, I know it in and out, and uh, I have to say that I'm very proud of what, oh my God, of what, um, of what this, um, sorry, my screen was messing up, as you could probably see, uh, what we've done. So what I'm going to do is to, today is to take you through a little bit of that standard, and you will actually be able to um, see some of the descriptions of this in the ebook that um, is coming out on Test Huddle next month. Um, it's an extract from another book, which I'll talk to you about later. So let's jump into it, um, and I hope you're going to enjoy what we're going through. Now, as a tester, you have probably had the uh, experience several times of being told to test somebody, something. Somebody comes up to you and say, well, I have produced this, would you like to test it? And because you're a tester, you say, yes, I would lo love to test it. But when you look into it, it might seem uh, a bit overwhelming. Uh, so you might think, where am I going to start? How am I going to work effectively on this? What is this all about? So if you are lucky, or maybe not so lucky, you get some description of what the system is going to do the test basis or, or the test material, as we call it, hopefully an expression of um, what the expectations are for the system, what the different stakeholders would like to see when the system goes live. So this is where we start. I have uh, taken an example that I think most of us can relate to. It's a benefit scheme from one of the airlines, and this is the front of their homepage and also the front of the requirement specification for the system. Um, so you're probably already starting to think, how, how would I actually be able to test this? Where should I, um, how should I attack the testing of this? So uh, I'll let you think about that for a moment. And then what we'll do later is going through a little bit of how you can actually start such a, a testing job. Now, what I'll do before I jump into testing is just give a few minutes to, to what the development of IT systems is about. I usually talk about the building blocks shown here, requirements engineering, design, coding, and integration. That is the, those are the activities that you have to go through when you develop something. And if we order them as they are ordered here, it's the sequential, what we traditionally call sequential development. You do the requirements, you do the design, you do the coding, the integration, and there you have the system. 
if we chop the building blocks off in smaller chunks and put them after each other, we can have what we call evolutionary or um, iterative development. You can see an example here where we have three iterations with the requirements engineering, some design, some coding, and some integration. And in the end of that, you can present uh, your product. If we mix the building blocks and do them in very, very short iterations, we more or less have what we call agile development, where you don't have phases that such, but you do the requirements engineering, the design, the coding, the integration on a continuous basis in little, um, if you use scrums, in, in little sprints, maybe two or three weeks, and then you should have something that you can actually put into production after each of these um, these little sprints here. So these are are the two or well, the three types of development models that we usually talk about when we talk about development. <clears throat> so where does testing come into that? Well, testing is a support process, as we call it. That means that it's nothing in itself. You can't test anything if it hasn't been produced. So we have to have something produced to, to be able to test. And that is why testing is um, a sub-process and it's, um, it's subordinate to the development, if you like. It has to adhere to the way you're doing your development. Actually, we could do development without testing at all. We could go through the requirements, the design, the coding, and the integration, have the final product, and send it out um, to people or to the, to the users. But I think you will think just that I think as a tester that that is probably not so wise. Not because developers or designers or requirement engineers are, are stupid or not doing a good job, but because they're people. They're human beings, and as human beings, it's a fact of life that we make mistakes. Even if we get all the time in the world, all the best condi conditions, peace and quietness as we work, we will make mistakes. Um, I'm sure if you think about through, uh, through this day that you will think, oh, I made a little mistake there, or I made a big mistake there. So in order to... Nine one one nine is um, um, I wouldn't say eliminating, but um, talking about these things in a different way that than uh, what the V model does. What the standard talks about are test sub processes, um, subordinate to the development model that we are actually using uh, that is being used in, in the development. A test sub-process is maybe a, a traditional test phase. It can also be a traditional test type. Like we have, for example, here a performance test or some other functional test. So we have a, a test sub-process here that is all about performance testing. And we can actually start it as soon as the requirements stating what the expectations or the requirements for the performance is, as soon as those requirements are ready, we can start to plan and design our test. And when we have the fully integrated system here, we can execute the test. So this is a fairly long test sub process. We can also have one for the design, aiming to approve the, test, the design here. So uh, that's a, a a very short test sub process. We plan it here when the design is being made. We maybe we specify some checklist or something to actually um, execute the test, and we execute the test. And hopefully, the design is is so that we can approve it. We can have component tests. 
which is also a test sub process where we plan and design and execute the test uh, for single components, isolated components. We can have the functional uh, system test and we can have a showcase or acceptance test. These are only a few examples of the test sub processes that we will need to be able to test um, a project to the extent that we need to test it. Right, so what is this testing? Um, we say in Denmark that the cherished child has many names. I don't know if there is a saying like that in English, is there? No? Um, I've, I've taken two uh, definitions here. One is the ISO 29119 that states that um, testing is a set of activities conducted to facilitate discovery and or evaluation of properties of one or more test items. Um, I was looking for the definition in ISTQB, but they don't actually um, explicitly define what testing is. Um, but there are other definitions in IEEE, well, what is it, 90609, I guess it is, and, and a lot of other uh, standards and documents. What I like best is the one that Lee Copeland coined some years ago. He says testing is comparing what you have to what you expected to get. And to me, that is what testing um, is about. It's about um, seeing what you've got and finding out how well it reflects what you were expecting to get. So to be able to compare with something, you have to have what we call the test basis. This is what you compare the product you've been delivered uh, with. And that test basis can be many different things depending on what uh, test sort process we're doing, depending on the, on the developed model, etc. So some examples of test basis are requirements, maybe in a requirement specification, maybe in the form of user stories if we do agile testing, or other testing, or agile development, or other development using user stories. It can be use cases, it can be a functional description of what the users uh, want from the system. It can be behavior descriptions or non-functional requirements, maybe something about behavior, uh, you know, performance, usability, etc., etc. It can be business rules. Um, you have to calculate this um, payment in this and that way. It can be standard, for example, security standards for um, risk, um, risk related systems like transportation systems or life science. It can be the design in at various levels if you're going uh, to do a design check. And it can also be um, the experience you have if you do exploratory testing, then the test basis will be your experience. So basically, um, you need to have some, something to compare to. There's one thing, however, that you're never ever going to compare with, and that is the code. Because if you compare your running system with the code, then you're testing that the code is doing as it's supposed to do. And it will. It will do as it's coded, but that must not necessarily what it should be doing if you compare with requirements, for example. So never, ever compare to the code. That is the one rule that I'll have to enforce on you. Well, I have um, pondered around a little bit, and I'll ponder a little bit more before we actually go into um, into the design and, and test, into the core of the testing. And what I'll ponder on is test management or test planning, because you have to plan what you're doing. We usually say that if you don't plan, you plan to fail. So a little bit of planning also in testing is encouraged. What are we going to do? When are we going to do it? Um, and also monitoring and control, because no plan is actually going to stick uh, with reality. Things are different from what you expected. Things, some things take longer than you thought. 
something is more complicated, maybe something takes a um, shorter time than you expected them to do. So we do our initial planning and we monitor and control what is going on. That is, we, we look at the monitoring of how things are going according to plan and the controlling is going back and replan. You can't check the change reality, but you can surely change your plan when things are going differently from what you expected. And then in the end, we complete the testing when we have reached our complete completion criteria. So enough about management, let's go into what is really fun. Sorry, boss. <laughs> um, so we have two basic test types and you're probably thinking, uh, oh yes of course, static testing is one of them. I hope you work well. Um, we're not going to talk more about static testing in this webinar. Um, just going through the activities uh, that might be in static testing, preparation of the checklists or the rules, performance and debriefing or reporting. The other best basic test type is dynamic testing and that is what we're going to focus on today. So according to um, ISO standard 29119 and I can still say it, then we have the following activities in dynamic testing. The test design and implementation, the test environment set up, these two interact with each other so that when you design you, have, you identify requirements for the test environment and you can only go on to test execution when you have designed your test cases and you have the proper environment. So having these two in place, we can go on to do the test execution and then we will probably have to go back again to iterate, make some more test cases, some different test cases, maybe adjust the test environment and do the execution until we have finished, until we reach the completion criteria or give up, as the case might be. There is another activity that is outside dynamic testing but used uh, throughout the dynamic testing and that is the incident reporting. Strictly speaking that is part of change management or um, configuration management. This is where we report all the incidents that we encountered during the dynamic testing. So it's very, very closely linked to test execution uh, and actually also to test design because we might find defects in the test basis, like the requirements, when we do our test design and those should be reported as well. So what we are going to concentrate on today is the test design and the implementation um, in the dynamic testing. These two test types oops, can both be used in the test sub processes. We can have a test sub process, for example, uh, a performance test where we have some static testing that is aimed at performance issues, um, more static testing aimed at performance issues, and then the dynamic testing, um, testing what uh, we have implemented and what the system is um, doing in terms of performance. So test sub processes can uh, consist of both some static testing and some dynamic testing depending on which one it is. Now, dynamic testing and concentrating on the design and implementation as it is shown here in, um, in the, uh, the diagram. Now I have to actually thank Paul Girard for coming up with this new Tesla model. Um, maybe some of you have heard his webinar um, and listened to how he was explaining that the, um, the actual preparation for the test, the, the test execution is um, iterative. You do a little bit of modeling, you inform yourself, you test, you refine and that is actually how we're going to do or how we should be doing this um, 
design and implementation as well. With inquiring, asking people, challenging people, and then in the end uh, come up with the way we are actually going to test. So, even though I'm going to show, take you through this test design implementation uh, activities shown here sequentially, you have to have this um, model in your mind that things are actually being done very, very iteratively. There's no way we can go through these um, activities in one go. No, I don't want to. Um, sorry, my screen is um, asking me to um, enhance the colors. I'm quite happy with the colors as mm -hmm. they are. Um, so we have to, we cannot go through these of defining feature set, deriving the test condition, um, deriving the coverage uh, items and deriving the test case in, in one go. But on the other hand, I couldn't show all the iterations that you're probably going to do here on the screen because that would um, be too messy. But keep the Polyterras model in your mind as you keep this, these activities in your mind as well. So those are what we're going through um, in details here. Now the details above the bottle, the dotted line here, they are the activities in the test design and the two activities underneath are the activities in the test um, implementation. What comes out of this is um, a set of things, if you like. And when I say things, you're not supposed to talk about, to think about documentation. These results of uh, executing these activities may be documented, or they may not be. They may sit in your mind. They may sit on, on your paper as um, sketches, notes, uh, drawings, whatever. So there's no Im implied documentation in this. But what comes out of these uh, activities are feature sets, and I'll go through all these um, results in detail in a minute. So we get feature sets, we get some test conditions, we get some test coverage elements, and we get some test cases. And I don't know if you're familiar with, with all these um, these things here, but it with test cases. So we will end up in some place where that should be common ground or known ground. Um, and over here we have the results of the uh, test implementation activities, test sets, and test procedures. And I'm sure you're familiar with test procedures as well. And I will come back to what these are. So let's go through these um, activities uh, and look at them in detail. The first thing we have to do is find out how we are going to um, um, attack these test items that we are going to test. And I'm sure you know the saying about how do you eat an elephant? Well, you do it by chop it up in small chunks and then eat each chunk at a time. And that is the same thing we do with the feature set, or we divide and conquer. So you can... Uh, no. This one? Ah, thank you. So, so um, we're going to look into these uh, feature sets, and what they are is a logical subset of the test item. So sometime, somehow you have to um, divide this uh, enormous thing or small thing that you have to test into smaller feature sets into smaller chunks. You could also think of feature sets as a um, um, list of uh, contents, a table of contents for your test specification. This, these are the headlines that you're going to work under. So we might have just one feature set if it's a component test and you have to to test on only one uh, component, or we might have dozens or maybe a hundred, hundred if hundreds of them if you're take, testing a big system. Now back to our example, and hopefully this will shed a bit of light on what feature sets are. Um, 
I have defined one feature set here for this uh, system, Eurobonus system, and uh, that feature set covers the use cases that is inside these um, requirement specifications. And I have divided that feature set into um, smaller feature sets, something for login, something about earning points, something about spending points, and something about benefits. So you can see that the feature sets are actually reflected here in, in the front page and in, in the, um, the requirement specifications. I also usually have a few standard uh, feature sets that I use. One that's navigation. How do you actually navigate around in the system? And in this case, you can do it by menus and you can do it by keys. Um, you can also do it by links, etc. So a feature set where I am going to test navigation features of the system. And then I usually also have a feature set for error handling, um, like what are the texts that you are going to see if something goes wrong? Are they polite? Are they um, telling you what to do, etc.? And then something about severity. If, you, if something goes wrong, are you getting a message of the right severity? And there can be other feature sets uh, behind this. So this is the first thing we do, divide into feature sets. And the idea is that you can actually work in each of the feature sets independently from each other. So you can hand one feature set over to a test designer, like the use cases, and say, would you be kind enough to uh, go further with the test design for this feature set? Will you do it for navigation, etc.? The next thing we're going to do, now we're going down to derive the test conditions. So we're digging deeper into what's in this particular feature set that we're working on. Looking into what is it actually that we're going to test here, can we um, divide those into what we call test condition. So a test condition is something that you can test from your test basis. It can be a function, it can be a use case, it can be a transaction, a feature, quality attribute, um, maybe something about performance if that's what you're going to test, or a structural element if you're doing uh, component testing or um, other sorts of testing where you're looking into the actual structure of, of the test item, looking into how the code is, is structured. So for each feature set, we can derive a number of test conditions, maybe just one, maybe many. And what does that look like in our example? Well, let's look at one of the um, descriptions inside this um, requirement specification for the, this um, uh, membership thing. This is taken literally from the description of the system. So it says there are three member levels, blah, blah, blah. You can read it to yourself. Your member level is determined uh, by how many points you earn. If you earn more than 20,000 in a period, and the period runs for six months. So how are you going to test this? How many test cases do you think we need to actually test this? test condition, you know, this, this piece of, of the description. How many test conditions do you think there are? Well, it's of course individual um, how you do this. It will differ probably a little bit from person to person. The test conditions I have derived from this are the following. Well, try to test this. <laughs> Uh, one test condition is a member start as a basis member. I actually had to talk to the um, to the the stakeholders about that because I'm not absolutely sure that you do. It doesn't say explicitly, but I have an idea that that this is probably the case. So this is my first test condition here. Um, the next one is that um, the member will be upgraded, and there's some about 200 some points here and 50,000, no, 20,000 points and 50,000 points. 
So I think this is this is another thing that I'll dig into. This is my another test condition. And then there's the one about the earning period. So that runs from for 12 months from the first day of joining. So it doesn't actually follow the calendar year. That is that is what I can extract for this. So I have to somehow test that it runs from from 12 for 12 months from the day a member is joining. What if he's joining on the 29th of February and next year it's not a leap year. Hmm. There's something to test there. So these are my test conditions. Still not not necessarily documented as formally as this, but um, as a sketch or some notes on my paper. So the next thing we're going into is coverage items. So what are the coverage items that we can actually derive from these test conditions. Now a coverage item is something that you can say yes or no to with one yes or one no as to whether it has been fulfilled or not. So if you say yes it has been fulfilled then case closed and you're happy. If you have to say no uh, it hasn't actually been implemented as I expected then um, you have to raise an incident report and you probably haven't finished your testing work because you have to retest and regression test if corrections come back. So a test coverage item is something um, and that uh, you can, it's an attribute of the, um, the test conditions. Derived from the test conditions using a test case design technique. I'll come back to these design techniques in a moment. Each of the test case design techniques that are defined will actually give you a different type of coverage element. So you can't just say, oh, I want um, equivalence partitions. That it depends on the nature of your uh, requirements of your test conditions, which type of coverage element you get, and also which test case design technique you use. So for each for a um, feature set, we take one of the test conditions and we split them in, into a number of test coverage items. Maybe there's only one, maybe there are more. So what do we do in this example here? Well, back to uh, test condition number two, the member will automatically, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How many test elements do you think we can derive from this? Or have I lost you completely? <laughs> Good. <laughs> so these are the ones that I have um, derived from this. Um, there's something about these 20,000. If you earn less than 20,000, apparently nothing is going to happen. If you earn between 20,000 but less than 50,000, you become a silver member. Yeah. And if you earn more than 50,000 or 50,000, you become a gold member. So any guess as to which test design technique I've used here? Ooh, what is it called? <laughs> Equivalence yes. partitioning, yes. So what are the different test uh, case design techniques that we can use? Well, we split them in, we split these techniques into three different types. And the first one I'm going to present here is the specification based, or these specification based techniques. Probably the most well known is the equivalence partitioning that I just used, where the um, element, the coverage element is actually partitions. So in, in, the, in the example, we had three um, partitions there. So we had three uh, coverage, um, item, three coverage um, partitions there. And if we want to have 100% coverage or partition coverage in our test, we should make a test case for each of these three positions. If you only want, want uh, it's difficult with three, but if we want two, want two thirds coverage, then we will only test uh, 
a member of two of the partitions. If you use the classification tree method, the, um, the coverage element is, uh, is a leaf. Um, I will not go through these uh, test techniques, but you can um, look them up in, in various places, different test text, textbooks, and see how you actually use them. Boundary value analysis gets either two boundary value um, coverage items or three boundary value domain analysis uh, in points and out points. Syntax testing doesn't actually have a coverage element because there are uh, theoretically an unlimited number of different um, um, mutations of syntax that you can use. That's it. Combinational or oh, decision tables is probably one that, that you're very familiar with as well. And there we define the number of combinations in, in a different in a specific um, decision table and we can calculate the coverage uh, in terms of how many of these combination, combinations we actually test in our test. State transition, scenario testing and a random testing doesn't have a coverage item either. Right, the next type uh, is the structure based techniques where you actually look into how the code is structured and there we have uh, statement testing as a technique where the coverage element is a statement and your coverage can be calculated depending on how many statements you have and how many statements you actually cover in your test. Decision testing, branch testing, et cetera, et cetera, path testing and intercomponent testing that you use when you, uh, you do interface testing. Experience-based testing, error guessing, hasn't got a coverage element. Checklist-based, however, it does, where we have the number of list items or the list items in the list. Check for this, check for this, check for this. <laughs> um, and the number of things you actually um, test for from your checklist is um, defines your coverage. Sporotoy testing, obviously, we don't have one for that because you can go on and on and on. Uh, attacks, we have registered attacks and so on. So this is how you can uh, determine your, uh, your coverage elements. Um, so now we have uh, actually derived our coverage items or coverage, uh, the, the number of coverage items. No? <laughs> right. The next thing we have to do is to derive the test cases. So how are we actually going to test this? A test case is a description of how you should actually test. It consists of input uh, and, the respect and the expected reaction from the system mm -hmm. and an ID, of course. Um, so this is an, a very small example of a test case where you have an identification. The input that you're going to um, press on your test item and the expected results. So if you use this input, how do you expect the system to actually um, react to this? Now the input you get from your um, coverage items um, and from your, uh, so you decide if you have to uh, test one specific uh, equivalence partition, which member of this parti uh, partition am I actually going to use? So if we're going to, going back to the example before and we say, okay, I want to test what happens if a member uh, earns two points, um, it doesn't match with this example, but then, then you have to go back to your test basis not the code and find out what the expected result is. So this is a test case in its purest form. You can also add um, preconditions, what is supposed to be in place before you can uh, enter your input, what is the priority of this test case, um, what is the, the um, expected time it will take you to actually execute the test case etc. So 
uh, we've now reached this point where we have all the test cases. And the idea is that now you have a set of test cases and we can go on to do the implementation. But first we have to look at the test environment just very briefly because when you um, work with your test conditions, coverage elements and your test cases, you come up with some requirements for your test environment and those you hand have to hand over to those people um, or maybe yourself who is actually setting up the test environment. So this is just an example of what requirements you might have towards your uh, environment. We need three PCs here, we need Windows 7 or later, um, etc, etc. So you need to make sure that you have caught all the requirements for your test environment and that your test environment is ready when you're actually going to execute your test cases. And likewise, you have to find out what your test data are, um, at least 20 members for various countries in the database, etc., etc. Who's responsible for providing them? Should you be able to reset it? Um, so this is what um, requirements for the test data could look like. Now, now we're coming down to the implementation part. So the idea is actually that you have this um, collection of test cases and now you're going to assemble them and put them into uh, an order so that you are actually able to execute them. So a test set is a collection of test cases. So we say, oh, I'm going to uh, execute you and you and you and you. Um, and then you're going to put them in a reasonable order in a test procedure so that you get your recipe for the test execution. And you have now test sets and test procedures. And it's actually a good idea to have, well, not many work like this. I don't myself. Sometimes I jump directly from the um, from the feature sets or the test conditions into the test procedures. But it is actually a very good idea to have these um, test set here, test sets, so that if you have to do retest or regression tests, you can pick some of them and make a new test procedure so that you don't have to actually retest the test cases that you that are not interesting in in the uh, in the context. Anyway. A test procedure might look like this. Again, an ID, number, the objective, priority, etc., etc., and then the test cases here that you're going to execute, the input, the expected result, and then you might have a, a column here to lock your actual results uh, when you actually execute the test case on your test item, sitting at the screen, perhaps entering blah 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 blah, looking at the screen and see what is the actual result compared to the expected result. <laughs> so when you get you have made your test procedure, we're going to actually execute it. And this is what we've all been waiting for. How is the system working compared to what we wanted to do? So don't jump into it. Don't uh, start ahead of time. Check your start criteria. Are all the test cases there? Is the environment as you expect it to be? Have you got the right test data? Have the, um, the system passed the previous test um, sub process? Whatever the test criteria are. And then follow the test procedure, at least in structured testing, um, so that you can compare the time with the estimate so that you don't use half an hour on a test case or test procedure that was only supposed to work to, uh, to take two minutes or five minutes, otherwise your test manager will be unhappy um, because he wants or she wants the progress to be comparable with the plan. Um, and the test should be repeatable if you do retesting and regression testing and it can't be repeatable if you do something else than what is in the test procedure. And maybe you work for 
for some place in some place where you have to have an audit. But this doesn't mean that you shouldn't note down any extra ideas to you, you get through the execution of this test procedure. This is only concerned with structured test where you do test according to the test procedures. But what you learn from doing all this will be very, very um, useful input to uh, exploratory testing, for example, to perform otherwise uh, afterwards uh, to supplement the structured testing. So it's not so that if you do structured testing like this, you can't test in any other way. Different ways are supposed to um, enhance each other and make each other more valuable. So when you do this in this very structured way, make notes of, oh, I would have liked to test this, and oh, I would have liked to test this. And then maybe you can do more test cases, or you can go on to do an exploratory testing based on your um, on your um, on what you learned from this test. So what we're doing now is identifying failures. So we have our test case here. And um, now I've changed the expectation, but never mind. We still have to enter two and um, expect four. And when we sit there at the screen, we might get what we expect, in which case we're reasonably happy, or we might get something else. So if the actual result is equal to the expected result, we say that um, the test result is passed. The test has actually passed. If it isn't, oh, if this one should be here. Oh, there's a defect here. I did my best, <laughs> but I made a mistake. So if the actual result is different from the expected result, then it follows that the test result is that the test has actually has failed. So you have to be careful when you compare so that you don't miss uh, failures uh, and say, oh, we are happy the test has, has passed, or you don't actually make um, something that is correct uh, state that as a failure. But this is, this is the test result, either passed or failed, depending on whether the actual result um, is uh, what you expected. And then you can, if you like, lock that. Uh, and if you have place in your test procedure, you can actually lock it here, either by just making a tick mark uh, or by if, if uh, the test passed. Or maybe you can reference to uh, um, an incident report if the test failed and you have to uh, raise an incident report. In safety critical systems, you can't get away with the tick mark. You actually have to either write or make a screen dump or whatever so that you can show what the actual output was. Um, so that's a slightly different story. So this is it. We've been through the, the dynamic testing process here. Uh, most weight on the test design and implementation, a little bit on the test environment, and a little bit on the test, ex ex uh, test execution, and not much about incident reporting, but they all hang together. Um, and then we have a commer commercial break. Actually, the, um, the e-book that comes with this uh, webinar is an extract from this um, very big book um, uh, <laughs> uh, it's from uh, section 5.2, where it actually, um, I write most of what I've been saying here, or maybe I'm saying most of what is written. Um, anyway, this full book here will come out uh, shortly in October, and if you get the e-book, you will get a 20% discount on it. Right, that's all for now. Derek, are you awake? Hello, Annie Matt. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. I'm just going to open up my screen here once again. Okay, so you should see my screen here now. Let me share with you one more time as well the link that will bring you into the discussion. And you'll see that pop up into your chat box there. 
Now before we head over to Test Tuttle, just wanted to mention as well that we have another webinar coming up next week. And this webinar will be with Fran O'Hara. And he'll be presenting Slow Down to Speed Up, Leveraging Quality to Enable Productivity and Speed. And finally, this coming Friday is our early bird deadline. So if you register a place before Friday, you can make savings of up to 200 euros on your conference ticket. And you can also make um, even bigger savings when you register a group where every fifth attendee goes free. And as Andy Matt has mentioned as well, we will be releasing an ebook next month, which will contain the content of this webinar. So um, make sure you, you check that out. It's going to be a really great read. Thank you very much again, Annie Met, for the webinar. And thank you. thank you to all of our attendees today. I'm now going to close the platform and I will see you all over on Test Huddle where we will continue the discussion. Take care and goodbye. Bye. I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>